in a way that they that is respectful to them. And how do you tell someone else's story? By listening to them. Um, and more, more than that, if you can listen, if you can observe, and you can listen to the perspective of your users, and the perspective of folks who might not even be end users, but will use your product, your code, your, you know, the output of your work after you, that you can better meet their needs. You can better meet their work processes. You can better in integrate with their lives. And you can better, you can work better. So how, how does one go about um, picking up some empathy? It's not like picking up a six pack of beer on the way to a party. Uh, so I'll give you some examples of a, of a recent user research project that I did. Um, this was a project with Mozilla. We were interested in learning about how people use passwords and logins. And so what we did is we, we, we spent time with 10 participants in two cities, Portland and Nashville, and we sought out a range of socioeconomic and educational and technical backgrounds. One thing, that, you know, one thing that's super important in doing user research is avoiding what one calls a homophilia. And oftentimes, if you work in a tech company and and you know you hate your friends with the people you work with, and you tend to live in, a, in an isolated bubble. People tend to congregate with people who are just like them. And oftentimes, there's a lot of confirmation bias. And, oh, well, I built this and it's awesome. Well, you know, my coworker who sits next to me, they better say that it's awesome, or otherwise, it would be very awkward at happy hour. Um, or if your boss decided that something was, you know, a good idea, you'll say, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Um, and so to get outside of your comfort zone, to talk to people you don't know who are not like you, is hugely important for developing design outcomes that are actually meaningful. And when I go out into the field, I often bring folks with me. I love to bring engineers into the field because they have what I would call oh shit moments. <laughs> that, <laughs> that they're not their users and will not only do a sort of what I call semi-structured interview, we'll also talk to people, whether it's in a workplace or in a home environment, and talk to them about not only the sort of technology we're interested in designing, but just their technology in general. So I always ask for a tech tour of people's houses. So, you know, if their router is like by their old Timberlands and underneath some, their gym shoes, like that says something. Um, and so, you know, I one of the, it's. I think it's super important to know not only the full needs of your users, but also the context in which they're using your products. And so Rachel and I are both trained in ethnography, and there's a lot of different ways to do ethnography. Um, but the technique that I use in the field is semi-structured interviews. And oftentimes that means I'll, wait, I'll work with a project team and figure out what it is we want to know about. We'll come up with some questions and some points to cover that, that touch on those topics. But we also let folks come to them in their, in their own time. Did you want to add anything? <laughs> okay. Um, another thing that I... That I, another technique that I like is doing a diary study. And this is a really great, lightweight way to gather user data. Um, and to get perspective that maybe would, won't come out the first time you talk to someone. So for this, this study about passwords, you know, I talked to several people who were like, oh, you know, my password's it's fine, like, I can remember my passwords. Well, I gave them a diary study, and, you know, in the next two, in, Two weeks later, they all had five or six times when they'd forgotten their password. And then they were ready to like spill the beans and be like, oh my god, I don't know how to keep track of my passwords. Um, I also use a technique called participatory journey mapping, where I have folks draw the ecosystems that they work through in their processes. And that gives us some really nice visual metaphors for, and as well as psychological metaphors for how mental, their mental models work. 
And for this this password project, I had folks draw their passwords, which <laughs> <laughs> this is not actually, and this is a really this is if I can give you one insight about doing user research, is that let the user let the participants do what they want to do, and it'll be awesome. I, you know, I had a woman sit, one of the first women I interviewed, I sat down with her to do journey map, and I said, well, let's think about one of your passwords, and she just started drawing, and I was like, what, what are you doing? She's like, I'm drawing a picture in my mind when I think about my, pa my favorite password, <laughs> <laughs> and I love these, because not only were they, like, complex and weird, but they're, like, people love thinking about it, they love thinking about the story behind their passwords. And after we're done, after we're done talking, sitting, sitting around with folks, um, you know, Clifford Garrett calls ethnography deep hanging out. Uh, we'll do a couple of things. Uh, sometimes, on some projects, we'll get the interviews transcribed, and so we'll be able to build a database of the conversations we've had, to be able to search for things and code them. I'll, I like to use a very lo-fi approach, working from my own notes um, and coding from there, either with markers or some other system. These are Evernote notebooks, which um, Karanda introduced me to, which I tried them for qualitative coding, and they worked okay. Um, <laughs> I think it's better for personal organization. But you know, looking through and seeing what the themes are, and then after we've after. I've worked with the team and we've done this initial round of user research. We do what we're doing here today, which is workshop our findings. So we're going to jump ahead in the process. Obviously we don't have time today to go out and interview users and hang out with them in their, in their offices or their houses, but we do have time to think through some scenarios. And the scenarios that we're proposing here today are should be familiar or at least sympathetic to everyone in this room. Because we can't work on each of your projects individually, <laughs> we can't really address like your specific users' needs, but everyone in the open source community is involved in the process of, of working in open source. So these are all profiles drawn from people who are involved in the process and how can we make the open source process more user friendly? How can we support our contributors? How can we support our designers? How can we make it uh, le less of a trial, easier and happier for everyone? So that's where our profiles are drawn from today. Well, and I've, I've recently worked on a couple of developer tools projects as a UX designer. And this is super interesting because oftentimes hardcore techies don't think that they have a user experience. Um, they say, oh, well, you know, this tool doesn't have any UX. Well, the command line has, is a user experience. Uh, your favorite text editor is a very distinctive user experience. Um, I, for one, have sat in on many discussions about the merits for, of them versus Emacs. And <laughs> these, are, these are user experiences. And if they're there might be one other, you know, one takeaway that we might bring from this is that the open source contribution process has a user experience, and it, and I think it can be made better. I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, what can it be made better? <laughs> um, but before we dive into our profiles, we do want to give you a little taste of what you do in field work, which is how to differentiate, how to have a look at a, a user or a user's context. And, and make observations about that and distinguish between what is your observation of an observation that is sort of dispassionate and what is an interpretation, which is you overlaying your preconceptions and biases onto uh, your user's context. Can you, can, you, can you introduce this matrix? Sure. So uh, we are going to be. Yeah. Yeah. So. We are going to be looking at a user context. I'll flip back to that image in just a second. And it, you're going to be writing down the things you see and sorting them into this matrix. So we have yeah. this will be this will be the second step, but this is an important matrix that we're going to use. Dividing between observations and interpretations. 
And then between needs and ideas. Um, so, I'll start. I skipped the thought. Um, so, we've, we've touched on this. Why, why do we want to know the difference between observation and interpretation? It's, a, it's, it's nice to be self aware. That's, that would be my number one argument. So, but awareness of our own perspectives allows us to understand how folks who are different from us might have different needs. Um, and like I said, when we're in environments that are very, very, you know, very insular, it's often easy to lose that perspective that um, we, you know, that we're, that folks are different; they perceive things differently. Uh, so. Without further ado, we're going to spend five minutes um, gathering your groups. If you don't have a group, assign yourself to a group. Assign yourself to a group, and uh, find you know. And we're going to spend five minutes just working through um, our own observation channel. Design scenarios. So when you first came in, you saw the scenarios on the wall, and you chose one. We're just going to discuss these in a little, in a little bit of depth. Um, to, uh, to to talk about like how we might go forward with these. So um, I did not do the research. I was Mia Culpa. I did not do research on these three types of users. But uh, this is adapted from a Stanford D School exercise and for an open source. And so, um, but we can pretend that we've gone into the field. We've interviewed these users. And we can also use our own knowledge. So if you've ever been a new contributor on open source, if you've ever been a, a burnt out contributor on open source, feel free to share your insights. If you know someone in, this, in these scenarios, feel free to share your insight and use that. Because this is what we're, we're trying to build empathy. We've got these scenarios, um, but sometimes in design work, they're referred to as personas. I would not call these personas because they don't have any data behind them. <laughs> well, but personas often don't either, so the reason I brought that up is because uh, these are an awesome tool for like helping people think about the problem space, but uh, they have, particularly when they're not backed by really good data, they have a, uh, a tendency to fall into really um, biased tropes. So uh, if you are ever in a situation where they're like, let's do design work, and they break out these personas where it's um, the, the mom who can't use her iPhone, uh, <laughs> then you should, alarm bells, red flags everywhere. So as you said, we, these were adopted from another exercise. They do not have data behind them beyond our own experiences, but when you are using these in your own work, they should be derived from field work. You should not just be invented because then you will probably fall right into the uh, non-technical bomb trope. All right, so Wait. we have three scenarios. The first is a new contributor, and even if you are no longer, if you are active in open source, even if you are no longer new, you can probably identify with this. Um, so any questions about the scenario? Um, the second scenario, and this is one that. I can identify with because uh, you know I've been around open source communities for quite some time, but as a designer, I never really knew understood where I fit in. So if anyone wants to ask questions, if someone experiencing this, you can ask me. But it's a very small sample size. <laughs> uh, then the third one, which there are probably other folks in this room who can who can attest to this, this scenario of what happens over time when you get burnout, when things change. And so we're going to start from these scenarios and think about what these folks are doing, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, and what they're saying. And this, the process that we're using is called empathy mapping. And much like we just did with observations versus interpretations, we're going to start from the scenario and think about saying, thinking, feeling, doing. 
And this is something that I find this exercise to be super helpful, especially in environments where folks are really into their agile user stories. Because the agile, because traditional user stories fit into this quadrant. But there's several other things, several other factors going on. And this allows us to have a better perspective in terms of, okay, well, what, what are these processes? Like, what do they mean? Um, so, let's get started. Let's think about this scenario. Um, in your groups, grab sticky notes, grab post-it notes, and start to think, uh, start talk, let's have a brief conversation about this user. Think of, maybe discuss verbally what you think that, what, what processes they go through, what concerns they face, and then, and think about these questions. Awesome. All right, so in our next step, we're going to take these stickies, and, and if anyone, if one person on each team could take a, take a picture of your empathy maps right now, because we're going to change them. <laughs> um, actually, we're going to do, before, yeah, go, go ahead and take a picture of them. I forgot that I added a step. <laughs> lightning round of this process. Um, so on the left side of your of your boards in the um, in the in the what is it? Uh, on the on the saying and doing we have practical needs. And um, I think I'm going to be the only person at this conference who has the word tampon in their presentation. Uh, this is a, so we have the example of a teenager going to camp. And on the left side are user needs. So things that she needs to pack in her suitcase, such, you know, such as band-aids, tampons, and Tylenol. Uh, and, you know, things, camping equipment. On the right side are meaning needs, and this, these are the, the thinking and feeling needs. So this is needing, you know, needing to get away from her parents, needing to make new friends, needing to do fun activities. So let's take, let's take five minutes and just to make some stickies with four or five practical needs and four or five meaning needs. So, we do not have to, don't worry if you're not totally done journey mapping, but we're going to add in one last dimension before we have to leave, which is in five minutes. Um, and this is where we find opportunities for improvement, which if you are the sort of ideation-minded person, like, this is your, this is your ticket. Like, you know, this is where we would start to think about features. So... Where are the pain, you know, as you look at this as a chronological process, where are the pain points? And if you were going to solve a problem, where in this process would you solve it? So, let's take five more minutes. Uh, try to identify those processes and hopefully have a little bit of time to report out and wrap up. Yeah, a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of pain points around onboarding. Which is not, it's not surprising, but that shows that there's a lot of opportunity for design thinking to make these processes better. All right, well, thank you all so much for coming. You've been a great crowd. This is, we actually got through everything we meant to cover. So thank you for coming. Feel free to keep in touch. Uh, and um, feel free to talk to us the rest of the conference about how you might move forward. Thank you.